people around the world are doing all they can to cope with the reality. And that's our focus on this week's edition of Foreign Dispatches on Channels Television. Thank you so much for joining us on this edition. I'm Anne Mwawadu. Let's begin the program today in South Africa, where pregnant women, like everyone else, are finding new ways to do usual things, from Zoom baby showers and drive through gift drop-offs to Baby Journey podcast. A South Africa Bureau Chief, Better Dibia, spoke to Veronica Modeleng in Johannesburg, South Africa, who says that it's been a hectic last trimester for her, but thankfully, she's set to drop at any moment. Africa Day. I must. 30-year-old public relations and events consultant Veronica Modeleng was just entering her third trimester when the COVID-19 lockdown began in March in South Africa. She says it took time to hit home that big change had come. And when it did, it was hectic for her. I was just kind of relaxed. I'm like, ah, I'm still like two, three months away from baby uh, arrival. But... I started to panic when I wanted to go to the stores and they said the baby's clothes are not essential. And at that time, we had, we had nothing, we didn't buy anything. And we were kind of stressed, you could see by the time that the child gets here, what the child will wear. But yeah, that's when I was like, okay, this thing is real and I'm not prepared. And I started to kind of stress about it every day and feeling a little bit down and unprepared as a mother. But as soon as we heard the news that baby clothes can be sold, then the stress started to come down. But there's another thought of um, when you go to the hospital now for my checkups, uh, my husband can't be part of the, 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 the visit because he can't, they only allow one person in the, in, in, in the session. So that was kind of painful and it kind of made me cry as well because like we're in this together so why now are they separating us so back armed with her chocolates and aloe water she says she breathes easier now especially as her line of business is still not permitted under level three lockdown in finding new ways to do traditional things veronica's baby shower was done via zoom her gifts were dropped off drive through style no hugs no kisses included it was fine, but it was not as you know what people you have your people around you and but they made it the best uh, and it's the thought that counts. So yeah, those are the kind of challenges that we've been facing currently, but we are getting there. For now, she spends time producing a podcast of her baby journey with her partner Tandu Figa Chavalala, who is a professional storyteller and trainer when she's not pranking him. She admits the COVID situation has taken a mental toll on pregnant women, despite the good side of bringing and keeping families together for a longer stretch than usual. Um, actually, three of my friends, four with me, they had their babies already. We were all pregnant, but they had their babies at the beginning of, of COVID, like during the serious lockdown. So it was kind of a stressful time for them. Uh, they, they were not coping, they were like very scared to say, what if I get COVID-19 or what if my baby gets COVID-19? So the energies were very low and I think it kind of put some of them in a, a little bit of depression because they started to be off uh, social WhatsApp where we talk. They'll reply after two or three days and they're like, no, I didn't want to talk. So it, it was really mentally... Uh, hurting them. We could see this thing is happening and they're about to give birth right in the middle of lockdown. So it was not a good time. It, it, it was very heavy on them. So let's look at the positive side of COVID. It has brought families together. Um, as, 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 a, as a pregnant person, you need your people around you. You need your support, but you can't have. But the support we've been getting uh, digitally, it is, it, is, it is huge. So let's not be scared because when we are scared that's when we 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 do mistakes i saw with me when immediately uh the shop opens for the baby clothes i just went there and bought crazy like like what am i gonna do with so many things this baby's gonna leave these things in three or four months but let's just sit back and think and also follow 
what we are told to do and uh, we'll be fine if you follow social distancing when you go outside put your mask mask on sanitize your hands all the time wash your hands all the time make sure that you have a sanitizer with you like i have a sanitizer in the car i have a sanitizer in the house i have a sanitizer in my bag so if you could follow the right procedures and stay away from going outside too often well baby congratulations are in order as Veronica gets set to pop at any moment. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Betty Dibia for Foreign Dispatches. And talking about babies, the coronavirus has restricted the access mothers have to their babies after birth. But this isn't stopping the hospital management in Colombia from bringing the two parties together to enjoy their moments via a virtual platform. Check this out. The child, born last month at a hospital in Colombia's capital, Bogota, in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, is hospitalized in a neonatal unit where visits are forbidden in an effort to protect the vulnerable babies from possible infection. But family members of newborns in the unit at Kennedy Hospital are speaking to their babies via hundreds of video calls organized by staff. You know that I love you very much. Papa also loves you very much, and everyone who is around me now is with you. Since the program started in mid-May, 143 families have made 260 video calls to children in intensive care. And that's according to Bogota's health secretary. Social workers who coordinate the calls and hold tablets up to the incubators are key. My job during the virtual visits is to connect the mothers to their children via the tablets. I go into the unit, I'm with the baby, and put them on the screen so the mom can see them live and talk to and listen to them. Colombia, which is holding a months-long quarantine to combat coronavirus infections, has nearly 30,500 confirmed cases of the virus and close to 1,000 deaths. The education sector has been badly hit by the pandemic, but many governments are now finding ways to keep students engaged virtually. In South Sudan, for example, radio programs have also been developed by the Ministry of Education in partnership with the UN Children's Agency, UNICEF. The lessons cover various subjects and they are broadcast twice a day from Monday to Friday. Interactive radio instruction lessons. In the radio programs developed by the Ministry of Education in partnership with the UN Children's Agency, UNICEF, are meant to help students continue learning after schools were closed to help curb the spread of COVID-19 in South Sudan. Our topic for this morning is reproduction in mammals. Now, uh, I said our lesson is about adolescence. What is it? The lessons cover various subjects and are broadcast twice a day from Monday to Friday. My message to all the listeners, please be patient as we work together with our government and partners. Everything will be okay and the lessons will go to you down there well. We are working on it. Just be patient and everything will be okay. Radio is one of the most common and easily accessible communication tools in the country. This is one opportunity where children can maintain that taste and that enthusiasm for learning. Um, it brings in the family as well because everybody will be listening to the program as well. And so even though schools are closed, uh, children are able to continue learning and continue that habit of learning as well and maintain that enthusiasm. Initially, the lessons were being broadcast through the National Radio Service, which has limited coverage and it is not available in some areas of the country. So a decision was made to use Radio Mirai's network to increase the reach. Mirai is brought. So I'm happy that the program is brought to Mirai. And I believe our listeners and our peoples across the country will believe from what we are really trying to, to put forward to them. Radio Mirai has also fully dedicated its news and other programming to informing people about the risk of the virus and how to prevent it. Graduation ceremonies have been halted, but guess what? Students are still devising means of celebrating their achievements and having fun. Check out these graduates on parade. Members of the faculty stood alongside the drive through socially distant as they cheered and held signs for the students who came in groups or with their parents. 
The students were encouraged to decorate their cars and wear their caps and gowns as they drove through in a caravan. <laughs> we want to do it in a safe manner so everybody's in their cars. Uh, volunteers have to be 10 feet apart with the mask and we made sure that we could give them a day to remember. They've done so much and we want to do this for them. Honking horns and cheering carried on throughout the event which the organizers dubbed Graduate on Parade. Since we are unable to do a commencement in sight, we wanted to make sure that we definitely celebrate our students and make sure that they know how proud we are of their accomplishments, especially with the type of institution where we are, where we are educating our region. We have many first generation students um, and so we just want them to know that we are proud of their accomplishments. According to the university, a formal commencement ceremony for its graduates will be held when it is deemed safe to do so. Now to the agri sector, which undeniably has to be on its toes despite the difficult times. Farmers in the United States have been left without markets for their animals, thereby abandoning some of them. But a charity for unwanted farm animals called Animal Place is now rescuing these unwanted animals. About 1,000 lucky chickens flew on two chartered cargo planes to a California sanctuary from an Iowa farm that has been euthanizing its flock as the coronavirus outbreak slashes restaurant demand for eggs. Farmers have killed off pigs and chickens as the pandemic shot slaughterhouses and suspended the food supply chain, leaving producers without markets for their animals, room to keep them or money to feed them. Animal Place, a charity for unwanted farm animals, rescued the chickens from an Iowa farm that was gassing some of its 140,000 birds because of the outbreak. Animal Place brings animals to its Northern California refuge by truck from within the state, but received a donation to extend its reach to the Midwest at a cost of tens of thousands of dollars. The group made the chickens available for adoption after checking their health. Probably have to help them a little. Egg prices are said to have shattered after spiking as consumers stocked up in March. About 22% of eggs go to restaurants, hotels, or other food service outlets, according to Ken Clippen, the president of the National Association of Egg Farmers. Get ready for freedom. <laughs> The United States economy has suffered a devastating blow from the coronavirus outbreak. Some 36.5 million people, or more than one in five workers in the United States, have filed for unemployment since the crisis began. Imagine using animals as currency to buy goods and services. Well, that's the story of some Cubans, and that's what they have resorted to as they battle to meet their shopping needs every day. Nelson Agula used to sell the rabbits that he raises on his Havana rooftop to restaurants. Now with an ongoing pandemic, the 70-year-old uses them as currency, exchanging them for food or detergent to avoid multi-hour queues at Polish stock shops. He's not alone. More Cubans are turning to battery into media shopping needs, be it in person or on social media groups, as the novel coronavirus worsens existing shortages of basic goods in the communist-run island. I only sold my production in restaurants, but now, after all the restaurants closed due to the pandemic, what I've done is to raise rabbit to eat, to exchange. I've exchanged rabbits for detergent because I don't like to wait in lines. I still haven't had to wait in lines. And I eat rabbit and I exchange rabbits for what I want to eat and for what you can get in stores. Shoppers had already faced long lines of some staple food over the last year and a half as Cuba's economic situation worsened with the implosion of ally Venezuela and amid tougher U.S. sanctions under President Donald Trump. Now the pandemic has halted tourism, slowed remittances and raised shipping costs plunging Cuba into its worst economic crisis since the fall of its former benefactor, the Soviet Union in the 1990s. There are several reports here of people suggesting there are resellers in the streets and hoarders are selling shamelessly. 
We have to act against all of them. Nobody here can be taking advantage of illicit activities. Nobody here is authorized to sell or resell anything in the street. Learning Damien who raises chickens and rabbits on his rooftop just east of Havana usually keeps them for his own family. But these days, he uses them in barter swaps with his neighbors. There are people here that sometimes buy oil but can't buy meat. And the only thing I can do for them is to make it easier for them to get meat. So instead of buying oil in the shop, I butter it for rabbit meat. You're still watching Foreign Dispatches and Channels Television. Restaurants, pubs and relaxation centers have deeply felt the impact of COVID-19. While some are beginning to come alive again with the relaxation of restriction of movement, many others are still grappling with survival. It's also mixed feelings for customers. These and related stories coming up next. At the Dadawan restaurant in the southern Dutch city of Maastricht, an unusual group of new staffers has been brought in to help after the Netherlands eased its coronavirus lockdown this week. Robots. A robotic trio of waiters named Amy, Aka and Anne James roll back and forth from the bar at the Asian Fusion restaurant, handing out drinks and lessening the number of trips that human staff need to make through the restaurant. Each robot has a simple humanoid figure, including arms, to hold serving trays. Simple displays on their faces show a smile or occasionally a frown. The service can be a bit stiff. Hi, here is your order. Please take it away from the tray. I will go back automatically in 20 seconds. Amy informs a pair of women seated at a booth after presenting them with two glasses of iced tea. Customers must pick up their own drinks. Though robotic servers were introduced in China several years ago and has since become a novelty at restaurants around the world, only a handful of Dutch eateries have so far introduced them. For now, Dadawan's robo-service is limited to drink delivery, but the owner hopes to quickly widen their repertoire. Our team is actually really happy with the robots. They actually have each their own secretary who help with the work so that they can also come into more contact with guests. Working from the bar to the tables and from the kitchen to the tables is no longer necessary. This offers extra space to give our guests a better experience. Staff who wear face masks, load drinks onto the trays, press a table in number, then stand back as the robot rolls away. Restaurants in the Netherlands were closed from mid-March to June the 1st for everything but takeout and delivery. Since Monday, restaurants have been allowed to receive up to 30 people with a minimum distance of 1.5 meters, that's 5 feet, between tables. Diners must make an appointment in advance. Let's head to Sao Paulo in Brazil, the site of the worst outbreak in Brazil, a country where nearly 30,000 people have died of the virus. Visiting loved ones in hospitals and care homes has been very impossible for these people. But thanks to a novel invention by local businessman Bruno Zani, families can now embrace each other again. <laughs> Daya Villa Boas, a 93-year-old resident of a nursing home in Western Sao Paulo, had gone 70 days without seeing her daughter until Saturday, May the 30th, when the pair hugged and danced together in an emotional reunion. It's been more than 70 days without talking to her. This hug is the first time since the beginning of the pandemic. It's very rewarding. The coronavirus pandemic has yet to reach its peak in Sao Paulo, the site of the worst outbreak in Brazil, a country where nearly 30,000 people had died as of Monday evening. But thanks to a novel invention by local businessman Bruno Zani, Dea Villaboa's daughter, Daisuri Villaboa's, was able to embrace her mother once again. I am a party decorator. I always used to make my spare flowers at the end of parties to nursing homes, and I made donations to the charity Floor Gentil, which works with nursing homes. With the pandemic, parties stopped, and that's when I thought of this approach as part of a social service. 
hit me seeing how hard it was for families and for the person who is confined. They could no longer meet. The nursing home was closed. It may not be a normal mother-daughter encounter. The two are separated by translucent plastic curtain outfitted with holes for Daz's arms, which are themselves wrapped in protective equipment, but the duo do not seem to mind. Yeah. Zani, the businessman who invented the system, makes a living as a party decorator. Though business has all but ceased during the pandemic, during normal times, he donates flowers from the parties to the nursing homes. He said he settled on his most recent idea after talking with psychologists, therapies and other specialists. While only present in one nursing home so far, he plans to bring the curtain to nursing homes throughout the city. Despite having that barrier, there is a touch that happens. The contact of the elderly person with their family members and vice versa is made possible and is extremely valid. It kills the longing that one has after a long time apart. We can promote this reunion, this interaction, this conversation. And finally on Foreign Dispatches today, a non-profit that promotes peaceful coexistence in the hilly neighborhood of small red block homes with flat roofs known for gang violence and police brutality in Venezuela are now using those same rooftops to entertain residents amidst the lockdown. The sprawling working class area of Peter on the east side of Venezuela's capital of Caracas has made headlines recently for brutal gang battles that rage for days despite a nationwide quarantine to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. But on Monday, June the first night, residents itching for activity after more than two months of lockdown placed chairs on their rooftops or sat on the theme. Concrete staircases winding through the sprawling barrio to enjoy a public screening of the animated film Aladdin, put on by a local non-profit. I think it's great, this idea, this initiative, because it's a distraction for the children who are in isolation. Children get bored a lot. We have done things like put on DVDs and there's the internet, the computer, but this is something else, a cinema but at home. The screening was part of a series of movie showings put on by Unloading Zone, a non-profit that promotes peaceful coexistence in the hilly neighborhood of small red block homes with flat roofs known for gang violence and police brutality. La gente ha recibido esta propuesta. People have welcomed this proposal with great joy and happiness because in this area where we are walking in, many don't have televisions, they don't have computers, not even a smartphone. And to see this projection, it connects dreams and brings families together. Similar projects which seek to mitigate physical isolation in the midst of the pandemic have been developed in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Why cinemas are close on us, why soccer fields are close on us, this cinema promotes the opening of windows, the opening of dreams, that from their windows they can dream and they can share this and bring the family together. And that is what we are trying to do. When doors are closed, we open the windows. The activities show a different side of a neighborhood that in early May made national headlines for several straight days of gunfire between rival gangs, resulting in the deployment of heavily armed security forces in sector of the neighborhood. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to keep up with all our top stories. Do it on ChannelsTV.com. I'll see you again next time. Don't forget, stay safe. I'm Anne Umawadu.